Once the Constitution took effect, the Supreme Court was called upon to flesh out the skeletal terms of the clause. Even though the main goal of the framers had been to prohibit state impairment of private contracts, the text of the clause did not distinguish pu private from public. In the early cases to come before the court dealt with grants and contracts made by the states themselves. The first major case was Fluster v. Peck, in which Chief Justice John Marshall invoked the clause to prevent Georgia from rescinding land grants. Two years later, in a 7-0 opinion, Marshall blocked New Jersey from repealing a land tax exemption. Then in the famous Dartmouth College case, the court would not allow New Hampshire to expand Dartmouth's board of trustees. The college's charter, wrote Marshall, was a contract that gave exclusive power to the trustees, not the governor or the legislature, to fill board vacancies. In a variety of subsequent cases stretching over more than a century, the court more fully developed its contracts clause jurisprudence and established a couple of key principles. First, the clause applies to existing contracts and does not prevent states from barring future contracts. Private parties do not, therefore, have an enforceable right to transact for all purposes at all times without restraint. The framers did not intend that Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution would institute a general freedom of contract. Instead, they meant to ban government interference with settled contracts that conform to laws prevailing at the time the bargain was struck. Second, the Contracts Clause does not override the police power of the state to establish all regulations that are reasonably necessary to secure the health, safety, good order, comfort, or general welfare of the community. Thus, said the court, a private company chartered by the state to operate, for instance, a lottery, has no redress under the Contracts Clause if the state later outlaws lotteries. That notion seems straightforward. Yet it presumes that the state's police power extends to regulating activities such as lotteries that are privately negotiated by consenting adults and do not visit harm on innocent bystanders. And then it goes on to discuss the considerations regarding emergencies. No state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. Chief Justice Hughes had found that financial hardships associated with the Great Depression allowed Minnesota to do exactly what the Constitution forbids. Quote, emergency does not create power. End quote, Hughes conceded. But, quote, emergency may furnish the occasion for the exercise of power. Although an emergency may not call into life a power which has never lived, nevertheless, emergency may afford a reason for the exertion of a living power already enjoyed, end quote. Then Sutherland dismissed that notion as mumbo-jumbo, quote, I can only interpret what is said on that subject as meaning that while an emergency does not diminish a restriction upon government power, it furnishes an occasion for diminishing it, and this, it seems to me, is merely to say the same thing by the use of another set of words with the effect of affirming that which has just been denied. The difficulty is that the contract impairment clause forbids state action under any circumstances if it has the effect of impairing the obligation of contracts. The clause restricts every state power in the particular specified, no matter what may be the occasion. It does not contemplate that an emergency shall furnish an occasion for softening the restriction or making it any the less a restriction." End quote. The suggestion that emergencies somehow discharge politicians from complying with the text of the Constitution was not new, of course. Seven decades prior to Blade Cell, the Supreme Court had considered the same argument in the context of restrictions on civil liberties during the Civil War. I don't think that's equivalent right now, even though this author does. I think that brings up a very important point regarding misappropriation under the auspices of an emergency in order to allow for state actors to interfere in contracts negotiated or engaged by private individuals 
or conversely efforts by state actors to interfere in and cover up for fraud involving illegal contract terms including intent to deceive or defraud a private citizen or a private person through an attempt to ensnare them in a contract that is not constitutional. This is what's been going on for the last 25 years in one manner or another, isn't it? It's very important, they said here, someone that was legally able to engage a contract, if you engage somebody in a contract believing that they're of sound mind, but in so doing, you secretly obligate them to other contracts that were not disclosed to them at the time with the intent of later having them declared to be incapable of honoring the contract you engaged them in so that that contract and the default on that contract can be used to try to offset obligations associated with a pre-existing contract about which they were never uh, informed. That's not constitutional. Beating somebody so badly that they have to go get an emergency medical treatment, even under the most general sense of the law, is no justification for the state mandating that they be put under contract to violate the Constitution. That's what they just said. You cannot obligate somebody to a, cons a contract that is unconstitutional, no matter who you are. 